First of all, as, uh, as he said, my name is Keith Kirsten. I'm from Omron. So if you're not familiar with Omron, we are a full-line automation supplier. So basically supplying everything from sensors and safety all the way up to robotics and vision systems. So we like to think that we have the whole technology offering to help anyone solve their automation problems. Now when we talk about automation, it's something that I've been involved with for quite some time. I've seen it evolve over time. It's not something that's new. If you look back in time, you can go back hundreds of years when they started to use water power to power mills. That's one of the first things that was considered to be automation. Now, it, it took some time to evolve to what we have today, and the acceleration of change in automation is getting faster and faster all the time. So it, it becomes more and more critical for manufacturers to figure out where does automation fit, and also what is the, um, what is the ideal amount of automation that someone might have. When we talk about what drives automation, really what I like to focus on is customers. Because really consumers and customers, what they want to buy, what their preferences are, are what define what people have to manufacture, which then also tells manufacturers how they have to manufacture and what they have to automate. So there are a few things that are there today from the consumer side that actually are driving a lot of automation that's happening now and into the near future. The first thing is safety and transparency. So customers always have expected that their, their food and other products be safe. But when we talk about safety, it, it means more than just making sure that food doesn't have pathogens or something bad in it. It's things like allergies and other types of ingredients that people want to know if they're in there because they can be hazardous. And even beyond just safety, people want to know everything about the products from the point where they might have been harvested or just ingredients, how they were processed, and then what happened to them afterwards. Think about things like organic, things, things that are ethically sourced or farm to table. These are things where customers demand more and more to know about what happened to their products and to their food. This means that manufacturers have to be able to track and trace items as they go through the whole value chain and be able to provide that, that information to customers. That's a challenge for, man, for uh, manufacturers today. Another is the variety and customization. People like lots of choices. Think about all the choices we have before in the grocery store, whether it's different flavors, different sizes, different packaging. Customers want exactly what they want, and they also get to the point where they even want things that are fully custom. So this gets to the, the idea of the, the batch of one. This is a big challenge for manufacturers as well. You need to have flexible machines. So the ability to have short changeovers, if you want to be able to run multiple things on the same machines, and you also want to be able to have flexible material flow. So when you look at things like mobile robots that can move around instead of having fixed, uh, fixed conveyors, this is an important part of how they can keep up with all of this customization and the variety that people demand. And last is global supply and competition. We all know that we're working in a, in a global environment, so we have global supply chain. So you need the smart manufacturing and the availability of data to be able to manage your organization. But on the flip side is we're also competing globally. This means that you have to be able to optimize what you do so you can compete with lower cost areas and still maintain your business and grow globally. So if we look at this, one, one thing people like to ask is, okay, so it seems like there's a lot of things that are pushing towards automation. What, why don't, are we gonna automate everything? Or as an automation supplier, we sometimes get the question, oh, are we gonna get rid of all jobs? And when we look at automation, we look at it more as how do you make the most of the, the workers and, and the assets that you have and get the most out of them as opposed to outright necessarily replacing workers. Certainly there can be a shift when we look at automation, but there was a good study that was done by McKinsey where they actually looked at this question specifically for food and beverage packaging. And they were looking at what types of, of tasks could be automated. And it really came down to only about 5% or less could be 100% automated. And those were ones that were relatively repeatable and ones that were um, on the, the lower skill level. The, um, the, the thing is though that as you move from there, there is quite a bit of automation that can help to make the other types of things more efficient. So there's a lot of tasks that, even if they're not fully automated, if the technology can help workers to be more effective, that's where you really get into some of the gains that, that people want and need. So, with these things all driving automation, how do we how do we go from there to a fully automated solution? <laughs> a little excitement over there. And uh, how, and what what keeps us from having that full automation that we're that we're talking about, or that we're making the most? There's actually a lot of things that can be a challenge for automation. I'm only going to talk about three of them. The first is 
technology itself. If the technology hasn't advanced to the point where it can do that task, then it's very hard to have it automated. Technology has advanced quite a bit in the last five to 10 years, even more so in the last five. So technology between robotics, vision guidance, artificial intelligence, it could do more and more than it ever has in the past, but the technology has to be there to be able to automate the task. This is becoming less and less of a barrier, but it's still there. What tends to be more of a barrier now is actually the cost of implementation. When you think about what it costs to automate something, that can be that could be a huge capital investment. That's actually what most people think of. Big machines, putting in a new plant, these are all very expensive and capital intensive. But really another part of the cost factor is more on the people side. So the ability to integrate it with the people and then also the ability to integrate it into, into manufacturing where the design is easier. So you don't need as many control engineers to be able to put something into a factory. You don't have to modify a factory. If you look around, this is where you see all these collaborative robots. You also see, like you're talking about with the mobile robots, this is where that, that part of the, the cost barrier is getting lower and lower. And a lot of the advances that you'll see in a lot of what we work on is to help to make it easier to take and implement technology in existing facilities. Another big thing that has that can both help and hinder the acceptance of automation is the labor market. So first of all, from a driver perspective, if there aren't enough skilled and unskilled workers, then that drives the need for automation. If you can't find a person to do it, then it becomes more and more important to make the investment to be able to automate it. So this is a problem today, is that there's not enough workers to do a lot of what we need done. So this encourages people to automate. On the flip side though, is when you are automating, it's important that your organization is set up to be able to work with that automation. So your workers need to be trained, the people that are managing lines and managing the organization, they also need new skills and need to be able to work in this new environment, if you will. So on this side of it, this can be both a driver and also a challenge. And it's also one that's very, very important. For something to work really well, you can't bring it to people's side of it. When we look at the people side of it, I often like to think about safety. Safety is a big part and it shows kind of the evolution of how the relationship between technology and people has evolved over time. You don't have to go that far back in time to a point where safety wasn't even really that big of a consideration when it came to manufacturing. Thankfully, that attitude has changed a lot. Initially, the, the way that that was handled was you'd separate people from the technology. So essentially, you put up a fence or you put up a barrier so that the, the people and the technology were separated. Now this would work, but it was not very effective and it wasn't very flexible. So what evolved after that were more, I'd say, nuanced ways to implement safety. Getting into light curtain scanners, technology that allowed you to be more flexible, but still be safe. But this is still, I'd say, more of the older way of looking at it as opposed to how can machines and, and technology work together to get the best out of both. We talked about the collaborative robots. We talked about mobile robots, their ability to work alongside people, and the, the robot can do what it does well, and it can help the person to be more effective at what they do. So when we look at where this is going and where a lot of the investment that we do is how can technology bring out the most from people, and how can people also get the most out of that technology. So it's that harmony between those two, which is a huge focus for us and in, in what we see going into the future. So. Automation is something that's being driven by the consumer level. It's something that is also difficult in some ways. There's some barriers to it, but going forward, it's the cooperation between technology and people that's really the uh, automation of the future. So, any questions? Great, thank you.